best class ever. Right, Suzette? Yes, it is. Today we're going to talk about organizational behavior. And the first thing I want us to talk about is job satisfaction. So as managers, as executives, one of our challenges is to make sure that our staff, that our team has a high level of job satisfaction. So there's certain key aspects, there's certain key characteristics of a job that we need to influence. So when we design a job, hey guys, when we design a job, we need to make sure that we take into account these job characteristics. Because these job characteristics are going to have an impact on the level of job satisfaction. So in this model, the job characteristics include task variety. So task variety means that the tasks that we have people completing, right, people on our team, we're asking them to complete certain tasks because as a manager, what's our greatest challenge? Our greatest challenge is to get work done through others. That's our greatest challenge. So in order for us to do that, we need to make sure that the jobs that we design for our staff is going to result in a high level of job satisfaction. Why? Because if the employees have a high level of job satisfaction, then their productivity is going to be higher. Their effectiveness, their efficiency is going to be better. We want the employees to be motivated. So we need to design a job that has a high level of task variety which means that you don't want the job to be monotonous. It can't be boring. You can't ask people to complete the same tasks over and over and over again. So for example, there's definitely a balance between having people get up the learning curve, having people being efficient, job specialization, right? So in theory, job specialization makes sense. Job specialization sounds like the answer to all our problems as a manager, which means what we do is we assign people to specific tasks and they become a specialist at completing that task. So for example, let's say we make shoes. Let's say we're managers in a shoe company. And we decide that we're going to implement this job specialization model. We're going to have people complete specific tasks. So for example, in making the shoe, we're going to have somebody who's going to cut the leather. So we're going to start with a big sheet of leather, and then we're going to have somebody who's going to be responsible for cutting out pieces of leather. We're going to have somebody, right? So that's Mr. Jones is going to do that. He's going to cut the leather. Then we're going to have Miss Morris, she's going to be responsible for punching holes in the leather. So there's got to be some, um, right, and let's say the shoe is going to have laces, so you need to have holes punched in the shoes. And also we're going to do some stitching, so we're going to have um, Nestle, right? We're going to have Nestle is going to do the stitching. And then we're going to have Yakuk is going to polish um, the leather. And Suzette is going to attach the soles. Now that sounds good. Now up until a certain point, job specialization makes a lot of sense because you achieve a, level, a high level of efficiency. Up until the point when Brooke is punching holes in the leather, and then she's doing that all day, right? So at first, the first day we give her that job, she punches 40 holes. The next day she's up to 100. 
By the end of the week, she's up to 3,000 holes. She's able to punch 3,000 holes in leather, and she's only been doing that for one week. And that sounds great. And we have her do that for three months until what happens one day? She punches a hole in her finger. See? That's the problem, especially in that type of situation, where there is that type of risk where somebody could injure themselves. That's a realistic um, dilemma for us as managers. Another problem could be um, that the productivity actually starts to decline. So maybe now we're not punching the holes in the right spot. And you can see how, while that's not as bad as punching a hole in your finger, <laughs> right? That's um, pretty extreme, but if the holes are not in the right spot, then you're not going to be able to lace up the shoes properly. So there needs to be task variety. So when there's task variety, when you are utilizing your qualitative skills and your quantitative skills, when you're utilizing your analytic skills as well as your creative skills, that's going to result in a higher level of job satisfaction. So as managers, we need to take that into consideration that we can't have people in jobs that are boring and monotonous. No job is really glamorous, okay? Um, but you want to have people use a variety of their skills. So that's the first component of the model, which talks about task variety. Completing different tasks, not just the same thing again and again and again. Questions about that? So that's the first part of the model. Then we talk about task identity. Now for some people this is very important and it's going to have a significant impact on their level of motivation. A lot of times people need to have this sense of achievement this sense of accomplishment in completing a task. So they want to start the task, and if there's 10 steps to complete the task, they want to complete all 10 and then enjoy that satisfaction and that sense of achievement from completing all 10 steps in the process. That's what's known as task identity. Think about if you're going to Let's say build a bookcase. Well, if you're going to take just these, you know, these boards, basically you're going to have like a, the box is just going to have a bunch of boards in them and a bag of screws. If you're going to take those boards and assemble them and create a bookcase, you can see how that's very gratifying. Most people think that's rewarding. But sometimes what happens is, and I'm sure you've encountered this, is there's 10 tasks that need to be completed, and your boss assigns you one task, Suzette, Brooke another t task, Kipway another task, Nestle another task, Yakup another task, and the problem is that you lose that task identity. Now again, for many people, they want task identity. They want to have that feeling of accomplishment and achievement from completing all the tasks. So instead of just completing one part of the project, which is very common because in organizations we are more so now than ever work as part of a cross-functional team, which means that we have a team that has a group of subject matter experts, which we call SMEs, and they're each responsible for bringing their insights into the team. So somebody is an expert in marketing, somebody is an expert in finance, somebody is an expert in quality, somebody is an expert in sales, somebody is an expert in manufacturing. That's the reality in the workplace. But even that being said, we need to think about if we're going to have somebody develop a marketing plan, whether or not we're going to have five different people, or let's say yeah, let's say um, five people, one person is going to do the executive summary, and then you're going to have one person who's going to write the product strategy, one person who's going to write the pricing strategy, one person who's going to write the promotion strategy, 
And the one person who's going to write the strategy for place, those are the four P's of marketing. We have to decide whether or not that's going to be motivating to the people on the team. Because we have to treat everybody the same, but we have to manage everyone differently. You see the distinction? So, of course, we have to treat everybody fairly. We have to treat everybody the same, but we have to realize that we have to manage everybody differently. Different things are going to motivate different people. For some people, they want to get a promotion. So the job title is important. So to go from manager to senior manager is more important to some people than getting paid more money. Some people would prefer a bonus. Some people would prefer an office. It's very common in corporate America that in the office, people work in these cubicles. And it's not very common that you actually have an office that has the door that you could close and have privacy and have meetings and so forth. So for some, the ability to have their own office is motivating to them, or more motivating than if they were making $5,000 more, or they got a $10,000 bonus. For other people, it's not the job title. For them, it's the ability to um, have an extra week's vacation. So we have to always remember that although we're going to treat everybody the same, we're going to have to manage everybody differently. And for us as managers and leaders, this is very problematic, especially if you're managing in the United States, because of the tremendous amount of diversity in the United States. So we need to understand the different cultural dimensions. We need to understand that people have um, different levels of education. They, have, they listen to different music. They are of different religions. They have different personalities. All of those are aspects of diversity and culture. And we walk into the workplace and we're so excited that we're a manager. And we have these people with all these different um, diversity elements which for the organization is a source of competitive advantage, but our job, remember we said, is to get work done through others. So you have all these different people, you might have 10 people on a the team, they're each of a different ethnicity, people of different races, um, different religions, and other aspects of culture that vary. So in order to be an effective leader in an organization, we need to understand our culture and also understand the culture of others. So we need to be cosmopolitan. Because at the end of the day, we're working with people that talk differently than us, walk differently than us, dress differently than us, listen to different music, have different religious beliefs, but we need to get the job done. Different things, remember, are going to motivate different people. So we got to consider the task variety, the task identity. And by the way, the reason why I also mention that is because in many cases, culture, the culture is going to dictate how people are going to feel about responsibilities that they have associated with a particular job. So for example, in certain cultures, it's more about the group than it is about the individual. It's more us than me. So some are more individualistic and some are more collective. So we talk about individualism and collectivism. We need to understand that. Because we can't expect that people are going to come to work and do their job, and we come to work and do our job, because we still need to manage. Managing people doesn't happen on its own. That's what some people think, though. 
They walk into the office, they, in one hand, they have their cup of Starbucks, and in the other hand, they have their leather briefcase, and probably maybe between their, um, between their teeth, they have their iPhone, right? And they go to their desk and, they, and close their door to their office, and that's it. And they think that Suzette is going to be motivated. They think Brooke is going to be motivated. No, we need to, managing people is a different responsibility than being a great engineer. Very often that's the mistake that companies make, is they have somebody who let's say is a great engineer, very talented, very intelligent. And so how do they reward that person? Well, they promote them. And they promote them to a level in the organization where they have to manage people. Well, just because you're a great engineer, that doesn't mean you're going to be a great manager. Because if you go to your desk and close the door, that's not managing. You need to engage people. We need to take responsibility for what people do. Because there's different things that are going to allow us to be effective leaders. The key to effective leadership is power. But we need to know where our power is coming from so that we could wield that effectively. Now, one aspect of power is what we call referent power, which means that people like us, people respect us. Now, why might that be? Well, one reason why that might be is because you're a diversity savvy person. You're a culturally savvy person. You understand diversity. You understand different cultures. And that's going to allow you to be an effective leader. That's going to allow you to get work done through others. Questions? Test significance suggests that we believe that the task, our responsibility, our roles are meaningful. It's important. You're making a difference. That's going to be a motivator for people. Now, again, this isn't going to happen by itself. We need to take responsibility for that. By the way, I work for you guys. I can't go home with this. I have like 200 pieces of candy. You guys take like five each. So, this is not just interesting. I don't want us to focus on theoretical. I want us to, as managers, apply these concepts. Right? So, for example, if we work in a restaurant, let's say we work in a Turkish restaurant on Coney Island Avenue, right? Anybody here um, like Turkish food? That's part of culture. Food is a part of culture. So you need to, you should go sometime to Sahara on Coney Island Avenue. Because one of the reasons why your employees might respect you or why they um, might like you is because they realize that you are culturally savvy that you are sensitive to diversity, that you have a high level of tolerance for people of different races and ethnicity. That's the key to leadership. So if you want to be able to get work done through others, you need to be somebody, again, especially in the United States, who's culturally savvy. Again, understand your culture, understand the culture of other people and embrace that. So with regard to task significance, it's our responsibility, if we're working in an organization, it's our responsibility to convince our staff that what they do is important. It's not the responsibility of people on our team to convince themselves that they're doing something important. It's not the responsibility of the people on the team to motivate 
themselves, it's the responsibility of the manager to motivate the team. So if a person comes to you and says, I'm not feeling motivated, you can't tell them, well, that's all you. You work that out. That's our job. That's our responsibility. We need to make people on the team motivated. We need to make sure that there's a high level of job satisfaction. So that's what we're trying to achieve when we're modifying and adjusting these characteristics of a job is because if there is a high level of task variety, if there's a high level of task identity and task significance, autonomy, and people are getting feedback, then there's going to be a high level of job satisfaction, and that's going to increase productivity, and people are going to be motivated. So who can tell me the difference between task identity and task significance? What's the difference, based on what we just discussed? What's the difference between task identity and task significance? Yeah, Brooke? Identity is uh, the person has a sense of achievement or a sense of accomplishment. They want to start and complete each step of their task. Right, from A to Z, they complete all elements of the task, right. And significance is we want to feel that the work we're doing is important in the world. And it's making a difference either in the company or in the greater scheme. Yeah, absolutely. So we need to make that happen. We're responsible for designing the job. We're responsible for designing the, um, the structure, the organizational structure. We're going to decide if the organization is flat or tall. And importantly, a word about organizational structure, critical, critical tool for managers and executives. Because you know what the organizational structure does? It allocates resources. The organizational structure, you probably often you're used to seeing something like this. Usually the boxes are not crooked, but um, something um, like that which says who reports to who, and what's the level of priority, and how the resources are going to be allocated. What's the most important resource that a company has? It's people. It's human resource. And that's why this is so important, because it allocates people in the organization. So if you say Walmart is your number one company, um, your number one um, customer, rather. Well, that's interesting. Okay. What are we going to do with that? Well, then, if that's our number one customer and a priority for us, then we need to allocate resources accordingly. So then, what we should have here is our key customers. And then we allocate the resources accordingly. So if Walmart is the number one customer, then we should have people that are specifically working on the Walmart business. So all right, Walmart is a retailer, and let's say we're a manufacturer. So we sell our product to Walmart. Then we need to have a marketing team, a sales team, a design team. We need to assign those resources to focus on growing the Walmart business. That might be an element of uh, test significance. If you're on that team that's responsible for growing the Walmart business, then you might feel like you're making a difference, like you're going to have a positive impact on the sales and profitability of the organization. And then <clears throat> autonomy is another job characteristic that will impact the level of job satisfaction. So how much flexibility do people have and are they able to work independently with minimal supervision?
The more autonomy that people have, generally, the higher the level of job satisfaction. People want to be able to make um, their own decisions and not have somebody looking over their shoulder. Just tell me what to do, and I'm just going to do it. Now, <clears throat> sometimes that can result in a level of stress when there's some lack of clarity about what you're supposed to do. And we're going to talk about that in a second. And then we need to make sure that people are getting feedback. People need to know if they're doing a good job. You can't wait till the end of the year and say, well, you're not doing a good job. Well, why didn't you tell me that the first week? <laughs> you wait a whole year? And I keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. And you might say, well, I don't get it, coach. What's the big deal? Feedback. So what? Because it takes time. As a manager, it takes time out of the manager's day to sit down and say, all right, I'm going to sit down with Michael. And you might have 10 people on your team. So what am I going to do? I have to sit down with 10 people every week? All right, yeah, that's right. Because... <clears throat> We need Michael to be productive. We can't do everything ourselves, remember. We need to get work done through others. So how are we gonna get Michael to be productive? How are we gonna get Nestle to be productive? Is by making sure that there's a high level of job satisfaction and that people are getting the feedback. So they need to know when they do a good job and they need to know when they're not doing a good job. And you need to give specific examples. So as a manager, it's not enough to say, you're not doing a good job. Well, you need to tell people why. And tell them what they could do to improve. So what's the corrective action? Like for example, on the assignment. If the assignment says 500 words, and you write a hundred words, then I'm going to tell you that you didn't meet the minimum word requirement. And then, although it says that in the syllabus that was posted four weeks before the course began, and like 20 times in the syllabus, still some people submit assignments that are like literally, and stuff like this you can't make up. Like, 80 words per question. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. How is, that, how is that possible? How is it that Suzette posts an assignment that's 4,500 words? Now, mind you, the minimum is only 2,500. Suzette posts 4,500 words, and somebody else posts 145 words for the whole assignment. But I digress. <laughs> But what I do is I give them feedback. And I tell them your score is a 5, and this is the reason why. Not out of 10, out of 100. Because you didn't meet the requirements. The assignment needs to be 500 words per question. And even that could barely answer the question that's being asked, but that's just the minimum. So there needs to be feedback. So people need to know if they're doing well. So you get, you do assignments, you take exams, right, you take exams to know how are you doing. So that's also a type of feedback in this environment. But at work, you need to make time to have like a one-on-one -on -one with people in the organization to know how they're doing. And when that happens, people have a chance to grow and to improve and to do things better. Again, this is our responsibility as an executive to make sure that these job characteristics are such that people are going to be motivated and the job satisfaction level is going to be very high. Questions? Now, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes there's ambiguity, which causes stress. People are unsure about their role and what they're supposed to do. 
There's a number of reasons why people don't do what they're supposed to. One is, they don't know what they're supposed to do. Think about it. I'm going to tell you three things now that are very insightful. So you're, you're kind of disappointed that um, somebody on your team didn't do what they were supposed to do. So you're thinking, I don't get it. I told them to do this, and it didn't get done. So why is that? So one is, they didn't know what they were supposed to do, or they didn't know how they were supposed to do it, and guess what? It's our responsibility to train and develop people on our team. And the third thing is they didn't know why it was important. You ever have somebody give you something to do at work, and then they don't tell you when they need it by, or why it's important, then you're not gonna you're not gonna approach it the same way as if they said, "Look, <clears throat> I know it's one o'clock, but at five p.m. today, I'm walking into a meeting with the president. I need you to do this." Then, oh, okay, now I know why it's important. Or tomorrow, I'm traveling to Chicago. I don't want anybody to know that I'm going, but I'm going to tell you. I need for this to be done before you leave today. Because you might think, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Like, I'm going to be on a plane. I'll be at JFK at 6 a.m. You see, people need to know why it's important to do that. I've had that happen to me also early in my career. I mean, I always tried to meet the, the standards and exceed the standards because we had certain... Um, standards of performance. And so they said that it needed to be done in one day. You know, we needed to allocate a certain amount of financial reserves. So they said one day. So I said, okay, whatever, one day. I'll do it in one day. But then one time, and this is, goes back quite a while, the, um, the manager who had 500 people on his team, so the, um, the VP in effect, said, um, he said, I want to tell you guys something. We had a meeting. Like, not just me, but he had like a series of meetings. And one of the things he brought up was, why do we need to set aside financial reserves in the organization? And why do we need to do it in one day? And so he explained that. And even for me, although because they said it needed to be one day, I always tried to. But then I was like, wow, the light bulb went on. I was like, wow, this is like really important. And then other people also that I worked with recognize that, oh, this isn't like random or arbitrary, like, I need you to do it today, or I need you to do it by 5 o'clock, like, why do they always tell me I need to have it done by 5? Well, but I'm meeting with the president, that's why I need you to do it at 5. So people need to know why what you're asking them to do is important. Sometimes, again, to go back, they're not going to do it because they don't know how to do it. We need to teach them. And part of that has to do with job enlargement and job enrichment. Job enlargement is when we give people more responsibility, more tasks at the same level of complexity. So basically, we're going to give them more work. But it's going to be at the same level. Now, that being said, job enrichment is another approach which we give people more work, but it's at a higher level of complexity, a higher level of responsibility. So for example, early in my career, when my supervisor went on vacation, she would usually put me in charge because she was grooming me for supervision. Right, you're not gonna put the secretary in charge. I mean, nothing against secretaries, but your secretary, your administrative assistant is not going to, in the foreseeable future, move into your role as a manager. I mean, it's possible. I mean, the person could be an administrative assistant that's working their way through this program. But 
Regardless, you're going to want to take people that are on your team and give them more responsibility at a higher level. So one way to do that, one way to implement job enrichment is when you're not there, let somebody on your team fill in for you. Let them step into your shoes. Let them be the interim manager for the week or two weeks if you're on vacation, what have you. Do you agree? What do you think? Suzette, when you go on vacation, who are you going to put in charge? Somebody on your team or somebody, um, somebody else? Somebody um, that you don't expect to be promoting to your position. Right? You see what I'm saying? Does it make sense? Right? As a manager, what you need to do is to give people more responsibility, but at a higher level, so that you're developing them, so that they could grow professionally. That's our responsibility in the organization. We need to hold ourselves accountable for that. Now, in terms of motivation, remember I said different things are going to motivate different people. This we can identify two types of motivation. Intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So from chapter six, who remembers what that is? What's the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation? Go ahead. The intrinsic is just you love your job, not for money. Right, so intrinsic, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Intrinsic is you're self-motivated, it's from within. Mm -hmm. That you have um, and recognize that your job is significant, that what you do is meaningful and important. And you might have um, a sense of purpose. All of that is something that's internal. We need to understand as managers that in an organization that some people are going to have a high level of intrinsic motivation. However, that being said, we also need to realize that there's going to be some extrinsic or external factors that we could impact that's going to influence people's level of motivation. Like for what? What are some examples of extrinsic motivation? Money. Some type of incentive? Money. Yeah, money, how much they get paid. So what is their salary? A promotion. So they might get, um, you know, have a higher job title. So they might get promoted from, let's say, director to vice president or from supervisor to manager. What else? What are some of the other extrinsic um, factors? A bonus? bonus. Mm -hmm. Maybe an office? What? Yeah, give somebody an office, definitely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the, um, the environment that you're in. So the, um, the co-workers is going to influence um, the level of job satisfaction, so the people that you have to work with. So you know, in some organizations, you work with people who are always trying to undermine other people, trying to make other people look bad, right? That's going to have an impact on your level of job satisfaction. We need to influence those things. Absolutely, we need to impact the environment. Is the office um, too hot or too cold? In fact, a study was done that had to do with the productivity of the organization that involved the lighting in the office. Yeah, so is, um, is the room dimly lit or is the room very bright? that you work in. Could you set up for us? Yeah, so importantly, that's something that we as managers in the organization 
We need to impact that. We need to make that a, a reality. We need to understand these concepts and be able to apply them. So it can't just be interesting. It needs to be actionable. For us, it needs to be actionable. We need to be able to implement this. So we need to make time in our day to manage people. Questions? Not a conflict and just at times when some people might as well afraid to move some money that yeah, they may place them so they don't want to get. Well, this is the thing. Sophisticated managers realize that they're not gonna get promoted unless somebody else can take their job. So if you become so invaluable in your job, they won't promote you. Because if they promote you, there's nobody, there's no bench strength. There's nobody that can replace you. So once you're able to do your job very efficiently and have somebody or more than one person on your team that could take your place, well then you're set to, you're um, eligible for promotion. Because now they can promote you and then promote somebody on your team into your position. But yeah, you have to let go a little bit and, fear, and know that I'm not afraid that I'm going to teach this person and train them and they're going to take my job. Good, you could have it. When you can take my job, then I can get a better job. So absolutely, you have to train and develop the people. And ideally, they will be able to do your job. We need to convince people on our team Right? So this is not going to happen on its own. We need to convince people that their effort their effort, their hard work, their time, their energy that they devote to the organization is going to achieve performance. So in other words, their effort, as a result of their effort, they're going to be able to get results. Now, do you ever get that frustrating feeling like you're working and putting in a lot of time and effort, but sales are still not going up. Profits are still not going up. Your client base is still not going up. Customer satisfaction is still not going up. We need for the people on our team to believe that their effort is going to result in performance and that performance is going to lead to what we call outcomes, which is basically what? Rewards. And not just any reward, a reward that's meaningful to that person. Because for some people, if you tell them that if you do this and you get these results, that you're gonna get an extra two weeks vacation, that may not be something that's important to them. They may not want an extra two weeks vacation. Maybe they really would just have a better job title because there's a certain amount of prestige with that. It's not just about money. You might say, well, just give them a $20,000 raise. That's what everybody wants. Well, that's not always the case. When I was, um, when I was a junior executive, I, was, um, I had 10 people that reported to me, 10 college graduates. No, I'm lying. Nine college graduates. and. Um, the administrative assistant was high school only. And they offered me a job. They told me that um, they were going to make me a manager. And so 
there was a lot of speculation because there was obviously there was a position that was available and people kept asking me did they say anything to you what did they tell you come on I said I, they haven't said anything um, but obviously my peers thought that I would be eligible for that promotion and deserve the promotion and one day they finally they did they called me in and they said um, we want to make you a manager they said but your salary is going to stay the same so I said well I'm not going to, I can't um, accept your offer because um, I'm not going to get a salary increase. What do you think? I mean, remember I said different things are going to motivate different people. So I was like, what, 23, maybe 24 years old. I had um, the opportunity to be promoted to a manager. And so what I did was, um, I told them that I would accept a job and ran home and told everybody, I'm a manager, right? Because the money was not, at that point in time, important. See, different things are going to motivate different people. For me, it was more important that I got promoted, that I was a manager. And they had explained, um, in fairness, they... Um, told me that, uh, and this turned out to be true, they said, well, you're already so successful in your current job, and in the last um, four years, your salary has more than doubled. Uh, you make more than most managers here already. And that's why when we're making you a manager, you're moving into this new job title, you're already making more than most managers. That's why you're not, your salary is not going to change. So, you know what they say, a sucker is born every day. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, I went with that, and, um, and I, they, made, they made me a manager, and um, the next year I got a $7,500 salary increase. So, you see, it worked out. But people need to realize, us as executives, we need to realize that different things are going to motivate different people. So why do I mention that, give you that example? Is because the outcomes, the rewards, when we talk about expectancy theory, that's what this is that we're talking about, they need to be relevant to that person. So you can't just tell them, if you do this, I'm going to make you a manager. Like, what am I going to do with manager? I can't spend that. I need pesos, I need dollars, you know, I need um, money. Some people say, well, if you said it, you were going to give me a $10,000 bonus, that would be motivating. Yeah, I, I because I have experience, I work in uh, sometimes the post for, they say, I give them what they off. But this, I'm not, I am expect. I expect them more, sorry, if I do very good with my job performance, I need to get the uh, the similar rewards, not the day off, because uh, uh, sometimes job title, you cannot, uh, to buy something, you cannot go to, go to the market to buy what, what you want, so that is just uh, prestige, right? Uh, in another, for example, in country, a lot of high officials or high people, engineer, technician, they all complain, go for the Communist Party, you have a lot of, uh, prestige uh, status, but the salary is very, very low. Mm -hmm. That's why people come to the country of America or somewhere. Because right now, right, uh, I know that a lot of big companies, they want to save the money, always tight for the uh, salary expense. They don't want to cut the people, but they, they can even want day off, vacation, they, but they always talk about money. Mm -hmm. They don't really hide the position. Yeah, yeah. That, that's very common. Yeah. Um, and so, we need to appreciate that there's people, like you're describing, who the title is not going to be important to them. That for them, it's about getting a bonus, or it's about getting a salary increase, for example. Remember, 
it's our responsibility, especially as leaders who are responsible for leading a diverse group of individuals, it's our responsibility to be culturally savvy, to be a diversity savvy person, and to understand that different things are going to motivate different people. And remember we said at the beginning that our challenge is to get work done through others. And so we need to treat everybody the same, but manage everybody differently. And that's you need to get to know people. You need to understand that only that's going to happen over time. Understand what's going to motivate them. Understand their culture. Understand their family situation. Sometimes people will tell you, I'd rather a bonus. I've had people tell me that. And some people, it's they'd rather have the week's vacation to spend with their family. You mentioned that um, employee needs to increase performance in order to produce reward, right? Results. What about when external factors come into play? Like, let's say the employees know that the market is stagnant, for example. What incentive do you give them now to increase performance? Good question. So, in this model, we refer to expectancy, instrumentality, and valence. Now, in terms of goals, Kipway raises a good point. When we're setting goals, because how do we know? We need to also define what good performance looks like. You should always ask, what does good performance look like? How do I know if I did a good job? So if they don't give you the feedback, at least you know. You could assess your own performance. We, in the organization, we need to have goals that are SMART. SMART goals. So, Kidway raises a good point. What if we're not able to grow sales? We might still be working 80 hours a week, but sales don't increase. Well, yeah, we're in a recession. Hello! So, maybe good performance doesn't mean increasing sales. Maybe in that economic situation, maybe it just means keeping sales at the present level. Or maybe even sales only decreases by 5% during that economic downturn. So the, the goals need to be specific. They need to be measurable, which is very important. So whatever it is, either the sales, the margin dollars, the number of units that you sold, the percentage of customers that indicate they're happy with the service, the number of defects, whatever it is that defines performance, we need to identify what that is and be able to measure it. So there needs to be a way to measure our performance. In different industries, in different jobs, it's going to mean different things. So in some cases, you might be in a job where you directly impact sales. In other cases, not so much. But whatever it is, it needs to be measurable, and it needs to be achievable. So you can't just tell people, increase sales by 50%. Well, that's ridiculous. People are not going to be motivated. Now, in some categories, though, it could be a high growth industry. And maybe that is realistic. But in most cases, you're not going to expect to be able to increase sales 50%. And if we tell Brooke, your goal is to increase sales 50%, she's going to laugh. She's like, it's a mature market. The whole industry is only growing by 2%. How am I going to increase sales by 50% in a mature category? Which means that the only way that you're going to grow sales 
is to either grow the entire category through some type of innovation or to steal market share from your competitors. Well, both of those are quite challenging. So if people are going to be motivated, the goals need to be achievable. They need to be results-based. and time sensitive. So we should set something, um, we should set a goal and say, for example, that we're going to increase sales 50% over the next five years. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe that's possible. How are we doing on time? What do we got, another two hours? Questions? All right. So let's talk about. So we're good on this expectancy theory, expectancy, instrumentality, and balance. Effort. We need to make sure that. People believe that their effort is going to result in performance and that their performance is going to result in rewards. That's the essence of expectancy theory. All right, let's talk about justice. There's procedural justice and distributive justice. So in an organization, we need to know that there's both procedural justice and distributive justice. Procedural justice basically means that, for example, that there's a process in place to accurately to accurately measure people's performance. If that's the case in our organization, if there's a process that exists that, when implemented, will accurately measure people's performance, then procedural justice exists. Now, it's, that's actually a big accomplishment. We shouldn't take that for granted, because not all organizations do that well. As obvious as it might seem to us, and as much as we want to take that for granted, there's companies that don't have procedural justice, that they don't have a process that could actually measure performance. But even if there is, we need to make sure that there's distributive justice. Now that's where it gets interesting. Why? Because Distributive justice means that the people who deserve the rewards, the people who are entitled to those outcomes because their effort resulted in performance, they've achieved that instrumentality, may not get the bonus. They may not get the promotion. They may not get the salary increase. They may not get the extra vacation time. They may not get office space. So if the organization doesn't fairly distribute the rewards that are available, then distributive justice does not exist in the organization. If that's the case, people are going to be very demotivated. So we go back to chapter six, and basically what we've really been talking um, a lot about is that in organizational behavior, what we need to do is make sure that people are motivated. Why? Because if people are motivated, the organization is gonna achieve its goals.
even if a company says that um, the merit pool, so basically a company, what they'll do is they'll have a merit pool. So 3%, for example, they might say that 3% of the salaries for the company, whether it's um, the entire corporation or a strategic business unit, 3% of the salaries will go to salary increases. Now, if distributive justice exists, what that means is that if the merit pool is 3%, that some people will get zero, and some people will get 10%, and some people will get 15%, and some people will get 20%. That's an indication that distributive justice exists. Now, if you're in an organization where they say, everybody gets 3%, well, then you're not paying for performance. When there's no, right, where's the expectancy theory? Your effort resulted in performance, but there's no rewards. So there, where's the balance? That's a problem, and that's common. I wouldn't be surprised if quite a few people here said that, yeah, everybody got 3%. Well, where's the equity? Where's the fairness? You work 70 hours a week, somebody else works 37 and a half hours a week, and you both get the same grades. So there's no justice. There's no distributive justice. Questions? So the way you quantify rewards, that's basically, it's not constant throughout most companies. It varies from quality. Well, it depends. Different organizations are going to have different rewards at their disposal. Um, traditionally, it could be a salary increase, but there could be other um, benefits. Like, for example, another reward might be you have um, they give you a company car, for example. So that would be um, a reward. They don't give everybody a company car, but they might um, give you a company car. Like, well, what are some of the measures, though? Because you mentioned that companies need to, uh, a system in which to measure their rewards. Like, what's some typical measure? Like, how do they quantify it? Of the results or the rewards? The, what the employee is achieving or what the, um, what the company is distributing? You mean specifically, you're talking about expectancy theory or distributive justice? Well, this, yeah, no, before, what was the point of this? this before expectancy theory, right? You mentioned, um, Every company has to find a way to measure the results. Oh, the procedural justice. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, tell tell me. So your question is about procedural justice. Yes, I'm just saying like what what do they use to measure the rewards? Like what constant? Oh, not the rewards. You mean their performance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, um, one of the main um, tools is the observation of the direct supervisor. So the direct supervisor evaluates that person's work. So let's say, for example, every time um, they submit a report, the supervisor writes a report. And they might have, for example, 10 criteria or 10 standards. And the supervisor will grade them on each of the standards. You know, was the report accurate, et cetera. Um, that's usually the most reliable um, some companies have what's called 360 degree feedback, which means that if you work on that cross-functional team with all the different subject matter experts, then you'll ask, have, your supervisor will ask the people that you work with on the team what they think about your performance. You know, did you step up to the plate and be the advocate for marketing or manufacturing? So those are some of the um, some of the key metrics. It depends on the industry. Um, it could be the number of um, the number of holes that you punch in leather per day. It could be the number of um, calls that you've taken from customers. The number of orders that you process. So it really depends on um, on the organization. Uh, 
for right now, economic downturn, uh, a lot of big companies, downsizing people, lay off. But uh, some some high man uh, senior managers, they still get a good salary, a bonus. But the lower employee, right, is uh, the, the salary increase not the, not increase a lot, it, 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 or no no increase. It's not very fair. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, the, for the for the big company, the boss thing, right now, job market is a very difficult situation. Even I think. I, I don't uh, increase the salary, even you still can stay in my company because you go outside, same thing. Or you couldn't find a good job because the, uh, some, even some job is outsourcing to the other countries. Or some band, right? They, they don't want to use too much band teller. They use the machine. Uh, they, or they uh, or outsource the, the, some finance job for the other countries. Yes? But no job market is more tight. So for the invoice, it's not difficult, uh, difficult to request uh, a lot of benefit. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So they know that like they have you between a rock and a hard place. You're not in a position to negotiate because they say, well, you know, get a job someplace else. That's unfortunate. Ideally, the organization should pay for performance. It means if you get the results, then you should be rewarded accordingly.